Hey, everyone. Good. Oh, hey, Shari. And hey, Martin. It's so nice to see faces coming in from session to session. Thank you so much for that. Hey, hello. Well, we, um, just coming from a session where they were talking about how to engage introverts. I am just going to put it out there. I would love to see your faces, but if you're also not comfortable with being on camera, that is completely fine. Today is, well, hi, I'm Cheska. For those of you who weren't in the session before, uh, I'm leading growth at Butter. And today is a big day for us because we are launching Seeds, our new product, uh, out into the world and out on product hunt. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please do so. I'm going to drop a link in chat where you can find it and you can hopefully give us a bit of support. Um, Ariana will be sharing, uh, will actually stretch the product to its, like she has a lot of activities that, that she's going to be doing today to stretch the product out to its limit. And essentially, um, the product is, think of it as a combined canvas, um, engagement tool, and also presentation tool in one. And really hope that um, that you you check it out and give us some feedback. But for today, the the main goal for Scene and Scenes is for you to actually learn from the experts that we've brought in. Ariana Martin being one of them. She is part of the team at EY Soren, and uh, it's a CX CX expert there. And today she will be taking us through her own experience of ed ca edge cases and unhappy paths, and cable. how this has <laughs> led her creativity and inspiration. Okay, so hopefully you guys have your pens and papers ready. And hey, Jacob, <laughs> sorry. Hopefully you have your pens and papers ready in terms of getting all the learnings from her. And yeah, off to Ariana. All right. Thanks, everyone. So, Can you all hear me okay? I hope. All right. Great. Um, so welcome everyone to this session, uh, as Shaska mentioned. So I'm here to um, share a bit of my experience around edge cases and unhappy paths and how that led me to you know, being inspired and like being creative with my work. So just a little bit about me. So as I mentioned, my name is Ariana. Um, I'm currently a senior service designer at um, EY Seren. Um, I'm based in London at the moment, um, but I previously lived and worked in New York City, Berlin and Manila. Um, currently, I am working on uh, government digital services, but I've uh, previously worked on projects such as university buildings, library services, accelerator, or corporate innovation programs. So quite a bit of like different um, bits and pieces. Um, I want to get a sense of the people in the room who has um, joined this session. Um, so I wanted to ask what your current role is um, and what you're currently um, working on at the moment. I think for those who are just joining in uh, at the moment, I also dropped the link in chat for the scenes document. So feel free to open it and that's where we can be. We can go and interact. Let me see if I can also write in. I think we're, let's just give some time for people. Great. Um, Ian, sorry. So you can go interact on the link that I shared over. The freelance facilitator, US researcher. Um, you can also, um, yeah, feel free to like drop it, them here um, on the, uh, letter scenes or also on the chat, whichever um, works well for you. Learning education manager, great. Um, cool. Engineering manager, so okay, a couple of um, different profiles, so that's great. Um, cool. All right. For those who want to uh, kind of keep sharing um, what they're working on, um, feel free to like, again, also like drop them also in the chat if that's um, also useful for you. But I'll kind of kick off the um, the session. Um, so I said I can see in the different roles that we have in here. So I'm sure that you probably joined this session because you're either interested in product innovation or you're in the business or industry of building stuff, whether that's um, through creating a new product or maybe creating learning experiences or maybe like creating physical products. Um, just let me. And um, so as designers, makers, 
inventors and innovators. We're really focused on building good stuff. Um, so building great things is our bread and butter. And I promise I'm not coerced into putting butter on this slide. But um, so we really want to build like products that solve people's problems, right? And like really um, create them in the way that um, as makes uh, the experience for users really as seamless as possible. So same for me as well. So I started my career um, learning research methodologies and doing research um, until I realized that you can actually use research to um, create products and, uh, and services and put people's experiences at the center. So while I was on this journey back in 2015, 2016, um, trying to understand how to break into the field, um, I stumbled upon this book, A Burglar's Guide to the City. Um, anyone know what this is or has read it before? Anyone familiar? No worries if not. But um, this book was written by the writer, Jeff Manoff, and he's a writer that's focused on design, crime, and technology. And what really interested me when I saw this book was that, okay, this is interesting, burglar and then into the city. Um, I was uh, really curious about this because I felt like we were always so used to hearing um, the hero story. We're used to like with popular culture, we're used to like hearing superheroes and how they save the day and like the different tools and gadgets that they use to like save people or, or like, you know, um, like st strengthen the community. But I felt like there was like very limited um, POV on what society deems to be as the villain in the story, which in this case was a burglar trying to break into the building. Um, and so I bought the book, I read through it, I won't spoil it for people who may want to um, read it after this session, but the overarching thing that um, got me um, while reading through this book was this, um, I guess, this theme that was um, permeating throughout, which was how does a building transform in the eyes of a burglar? Um, I was very like very interested by this because when we think about buildings, we usually think about, let's say, the engineers who want to make sure that the foundations of the buildings are right and that it can withhold natural disasters. Or maybe we think about the architects who uh, make sure that the space is um, being used um, by people and like how people flow through the space and how they can make um, the experience as seamless as possible. And I found this interesting because if we flip that um, on its head and think about a user group, which in this case is a burglar who wants to misuse the space or to use it against the intentions of the builders or find a way to make it easy for themselves to misuse the space. To me at that time, that really involved like a different way of thinking and innovation because it involved like anticipating worst case scenarios or making sure that your product is built to minimize these scenarios ever um, happening. On a separate occasion, um, again, while I was on this journey of trying to learn uh, about product innovation, I came across this um, theory called um, Black Swan Theory. Um, I don't know if some of you might have heard of this, but this was a concept um, that was popularized by um, a statistician and a former options trader, um, Nassim Taleb. And this was really about um, have these like outlier incidents or events that reside outside normal expectations and carry a maximum impact. So they have like a large repercussions and people always thought that um, these are events that no one really saw happening, but then realizing after some time that um, they're actually predictable only after they've happened. So like looking back, they, they, people saw the signs of um, these events um, eventually happening. I have like a, a couple examples that I'm going to go through briefly, but I, I wanted to uh, see if like anyone has any guesses on what some examples um, would be of like black swan events that happened in the world. All right, let me move it in. Oops. Pandemic. Mm -hmm. oh, we all... all right. So some of you may have already I mean, started thinking about this, but some of these events are uh, things that, you know, we've, um, we've um, experienced uh, over the years. So the 9-11 attacks in 2001, the financial crisis in 2008, um, and like the COVID pandemic in, in 2020. So when we think about these events, um, they are events that like came out of nowhere and like really shocked the world and impacted the lives of many people. 
after some time and as people look back on on these incidents and how um they could have happened uh people saw that there were like certain um signs brewing all throughout that pointed to these things happening and i felt like that was a for me like looking at like understanding that kind of um, concept the black swan concept and thinking about um the different signs that could have led us uh, that could have led to these events I, I thought to myself like hmm maybe there is a way or like there is a way for us to like think um think about or like for foresee what these events oh, might happen okay, in the future okay. and raise ourselves for that thanks i'm um, gonna go back and register because for of the impact chance and wounds of these events. So there were um, breakthroughs and innovations in products, as well as changes in um, human behavior that really came out of it to brace, or for, to brace ourselves for future incidents like this. So as an example, um, for the 9-11 attacks, so that really prompted the creation of the TSA and enhanced airport security, as well as like the, all those like full body scanners or 3D imaging um, technology that we see at the airports, right? Um, that also um, um, enhance like large scale DNA analysis for ad identifying victims uh, on the site. For like the 2008 financial crisis that opened up the gig and freelancing economy, especially as people realized that um, their jobs are not as stable or people lost so many jobs, so they needed to find a way to make um, things work um, that also created the, that culture around open banking or open innovation, so opening up the banking ecosystem for more collaborators or, or players to, to participate in, and also the rise of, of digital banks. And... Uh, the last one with the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is something I'm sure we're all kind of uh, familiar with or had our own taste of it. Um, so hybrid working, telehealth, e-learning, this very virtual workshops that we're, we are in right now, allowing all of you to um, join from different parts of the world and participate in this uh, set of workshops that Butter is creating. Um, and also like vaccine innovation um, through partnerships and different collaboration models. So it's I think with all these kind of events that happened um, um, throughout the last couple of years, like one thing that I think um, was really interesting here is that thinking about if there, there's not really, um, I guess, like thing to say in terms of, oh, maybe we wouldn't go get into this innovation thinking um, if not for these events. But I think as a like part of our, I guess, part of our role as like re researchers or like designers, right, is like, how do we kind of make, brace ourselves or prepare ourselves for these events that are happening um, so that we can better um, mitigate them when it already happens. Wanted to pause here to see if anyone had any thoughts um, or like maybe any ideas of any kind of world events that they've seen um, in the last couple of years and kind of innovative products that came out of it. DJ and Ish, I've also just reshared the link so you can see it. Uh, people want to yeah just like kind of share your thoughts um by voice yeah whichever is fine too well i could say innovation in like butter and zoom mm -hmm. based out of the pandemic butter and zoom. great see some folks typing Well, a lot of the, well, you sort of mentioned already, Ariana, earlier, like a lot of the COVID products actually mm -hmm. spread about like vaccines, um, services um, that happen, tel like a lot of the telecommuting um, innovations also are there. Ukraine, Russia war, mm -hmm. global wildfires. We have a couple more minutes. I like observation and more prediction. Mm -hmm. um, crisis, crowd testing. Right. I'm 
antibiotic resistance. Great. Waves. Great. So as you can see, right, like, um, I think the... Well, like with all these like global events that are happening, um, the impact of them doesn't not necessarily um impact like just like a general kind of global impact, but also like the different technologies that come out from these um from these events. And let me move on to the slides. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, so because we are in the in the space of um innovating and like building um, building things, we have that agency to um, imagine futures and create new products and services. But I think the more important challenge here is how can we use our gift to spot potential black swans in the future and proactively think about worst case scenarios or unhappy paths and craft innovative pathways to build um, more resilient products in the future. When Thinking about these kind of unhappy paths, I tend to think of them into, I guess, two lenses. One would be like intent and the other one is scale. So by intent, that's like understanding whether um, are these like unhappy paths or like scenarios um, being done intentionally? Was there like, are there people who are actively trying to misuse or abuse a product or a service? And then the other um, edge of it is, um, are there like people who just, you know, are just kind of trying to figure it out, like making mistakes uh, while using the product or like still, you know, making errors in using the product. Um, and then the other part of it is scale. So like, like I mentioned in like the two examples earlier, the, the first example, right, was just really thinking about the building. So very like small scale, just focus on one um one specific thing and that can be either I mentioned like a building or maybe like just a digital product or within an organization so your unhappy past or like your journeys can um, just really focus on um, yeah how these people use a specific product or a service but that can also mean um, a macro impact so whether like all these unhappy scenarios have like a large scale implication not just uh, on the industry and the market but also on a global scale. And one of the tools, some of the tools I'm going to share now, like a little bit of some tools that um, my team and I often use when we're thinking about some of these um, unhappy paths and journeys. And the uh, first thing I'm going to share are mindsets. So I think some of you may have um, experienced uh, mindsets at some point um, uh, in your uh, product journey, but um, for this specific instance, so this mindsets really help us get into the attitude and um, help us helps us look at things with a certain lens. And the first one that I've um, I often use or look into is cynicism, right? So thinking beyond the user's intention of using your product. Um, because cynics often operate on distrust in the system or like in a specific thing. They try to find moments in, in specific in, in the journey where um, their trust could be violated over and over again. So if you're someone who's building a product, that's like something that you could use as a lens to figure out that, oh, okay, maybe my user will drop off at this specific point because we didn't build this part in a trustworthy manner and that sort of thing. The other mindset here is skepticism. So considering biases and the role of doubt. Um, so people might experience um, different biases that our products may be perpetuating, whether that's through the way that we've built um, our onboarding flow or um, the way we've um, communicated things. So there are like certain things that we have to be conscious about to make sure that it's um, it's something that um, our users are really comfortable in terms of using. The next mindset is pessimism. So assuming and preparing for the worst. So thinking that things may go wrong at any point, um, making all those like plan A to plan B to plan C and finding a way to re-engineer um, the product once we've thought about the different ways that a product could go wrong. And I think an important bit that I'll also mention here is that the I think the key thing of why these kind of um, mindsets um, was also important for me is because, as I mentioned earlier, I'm currently working on um, government digital services. So there are, um, as you know, like government digital services, like part of regulated industries. So these um, industries often have like higher risk associated with them. And so really thinking about like the worst case scenarios or situations is part of like the, um, yeah, the journey that we need to do in terms of creating a better product. 
another tool that I um, also look into are archetypes. Um, some of you may have heard about archetypes, um, but yeah, so kind of like the same as personas, but they're not tied to specific names or faces. Uh, and this thing that you're um, seeing right now, this is actually developed by Artifact, um, which is an innovation agency, and they call it a tarot cards of tech. So I think they had like maybe something around 10 archetypes, but I've only chosen four in here that I felt like was relevant for um, for this session. So we, ha we have the backstabber. So what could cause people to lose trust in or feel exposed to your product? The scandal, what's like the worst headline that um, about your product that you can imagine? And how do you, um, you know, mitigate um, for that deadline, uh, for that headline? The forgotten, whose perspective from your um, user base are, is being excluded from this? And how do you make sure that you're co consciously including them in the process? Um, and the big bad wolf, so what could a bad actor do with your product? Um, so again, thinking through how to um, put measures in place if in case a big bad wolf um, started using your, your product maliciously. Another set of archetypes that I also liked was this one from um, at, uh, from Elmadir Network, which is an investment firm, and it's called a set of ethical explorers. So this one is more less focused on the product itself, but more looking at it from the lens of an organization or like an industry perspective. Um, the first one they had was so outsized power. So thinking about how your technology might hurt the market or fellow players. So this is really around. Um, you know, like big companies trying to kind of creep into the spaces where there are smaller players, thereby crushing that kind of culture of innovation and like really like um, shutting or crushing those um, smaller players um, out. The next one, kind of similar to the one earlier, so bad actors. So um, again, how might your bad actors uh, leverage your product to spread harm? Um, next one is algorithmic bias. So algorithms or systems within your product um, and how they perpetuate discrimination and harmful biases. And then the last one, so surveillance. So how is your company um, proactively addressing issues of surveillance and thinking about data privacy and security for, for users? So I know that's like a lot of, I guess, um, different archetypes. So one, I'm curious to hear how, if there's like any archetype here that stood out the most to you or that you're most curious about, or something that maybe you haven't heard before. Um, that backstabber is new to me. That one is kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, because I guess that there's like a lot of um, you know building a product really is around building trust at different moments of uh, of the journey and thinking about how yeah how they can how that that trust can be violated at specific points. Yeah, it almost sounds like they are somebody who would, you know, want to make something go wrong on purpose. Like mm -hmm. they're just malicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? I see there's around scandal, so backstabber. I'm not sure if there are comments on the chat as well. Um, right now, is, is there any that sort of um, risk? It's quite similar to each other, you would say, or the ones we need to look out for the most. I think I think it really depends on like I guess um industry uh industry and like your focus as a as a product team. So I feel like at least for my experience working on um, government services, our focus was really more around like bad actors and kind of the forgotten, especially because if you're working on government, at least for my experience, so working on government services, so making sure that the services, like everyone is able to use the services in the way that they are comfortable using it. Um, and I feel like, let's say for um, other pieces here, let's say for algorithmic bias or surveillance. So I feel like these um, these archetypes are most useful for um, organizations or um, product companies who leverage a lot of data in their um, in understanding their users or their customers, and that really can kind of, or also just like companies who get a lot of. Um, user information from themselves. So think about, you know, like the typical social media channels um, and how they can, you know, like the, the algorithms that we see on our feeds are affecting um, like the, the echo chamber of um, opinions and thoughts. 
All right, so I see algorithmic bias, a big bad wolf. Great. Moving on to the next. So as I, as I mentioned, so as product builders, we often think about the um, ideal customer journey. Um, and with these customer journeys, we usually identify the touch points where the experience uh, peaks or dips. But a challenge that I'm kind of going to present to the uh, to this group is that also what if we start with a, a preset archetype or a mindset and proactively plot what that experience might be like. So instead of thinking about the journey and identifying that, okay, at this touch point or at this moment, the experience peaks and then at this moment it dips. What if it's we start off with like a peak all throughout or like a dip, they start off in like a really low level and it's going to permeate all through all throughout. So as an example, um, so I mentioned earlier, right, that I'm building um, government digital services and taking these services from um, zero to one. And I work with uh, subject matter experts um, at the moment, and we're trying to translate a currently manual process into a digital one. And I've been working on this since uh, July 2023, and we launched the beta version last September. And when we were building these journeys, um, these are the thing, kind of the archetypes that we kept referring um, over and over again um, when we were building out the journeys. So the indecisive, the overwhelmed, the confused, and the overly complex. So those, the indecisive, this is someone who's uh, who keeps going back and forth and hasn't figured out their own internal decisions, not related to how they use your product, but just as an organization. So once we think that, oh, yep, they're going to go through this in like a seamless manner, suddenly they they something happened on their end and they're stuck, can't move forward, can't move back, and they have to like figure out what they need to do. Another archetype was the overwhelm. So, you know, someone being um, overwhelmed with other things and can't be bothered to use the product. So even if, let's say, we designed a nice onboarding flow um, or like a very like um, seamless user experience, maybe at some point they just click through it and then they get stuck in the middle, probably because they didn't read or like read properly what was in the previous two pages and then now started suddenly started complaining. Um, so that's like one thing that we have also, we're also looking into the confused. So someone who just seems to be eternally confused about the whole process and are likely to make mistakes at different touch points. Um, and lastly, like the overly complex. So a user who has such a unique background, context or set of uh, requirements. And sometimes this kind of archetype doesn't usually come out at the at the beginning, they sometimes happen when they're like in the, you know, in the middle of like using your product and they're like, oh, they have a specific set of requirements. And how do we kind of cater to this one person who has such a unique background or like a unique, yeah, unique context and like deciding whether to, um, you know, make adjustments for them or not. Um, move on to the next slide. Pause here see if there are like any mindsets or archetypes that come to your mind um, from, yeah, from like the products that you're working on. Do you want us to pick from the old ones or, or the ones you, you can share? Yeah, you just like the current, current ones. <laughs> yeah, no, current ones that, that come to your mind um, that you've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmed. The mix uh before at least overwhelmed and the confused mm -hmm. uh getting excited about this typing <laughs> um fixers and optimizers mm -hmm. disabled <laughs> yes Yep, there is this uh, archetype as well, the know-it-all. Impatient. Mm -hmm. Incumbent. Mm -hmm. Chris, you want to share a little bit more about incumbent? Stun meeting. Um, no, so I, I some of the users that we're looking at have may have been in their career for decades. So, mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, behaviors are well entrenched. Uh, trying to get any sort of change in behavior is, is incredibly difficult, but they're also incredibly knowledgeable in their field. Mm -hmm. yeah so kind of balancing their knowledge but also like this the ways of the, their thinking um aj any thoughts on fixers and optimizers um so i work um with software engineers and one of the archetypes and that we normally get is people who will use a platform they come from technology themselves so they feel that they know the usability or how the journey should be actually opposed to how the brand of the product wants the user to use it so when you get android v's apple for example a lot of android devs will complain about the apple ui because of the control that kind of thing Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. Cool. Now let's wait for uh, who else? Um, the impatient Ian. Yeah, I think this is almost like kind of like for someone who wants things quickest. Um, and, and this could be from, you know, number of clicks, but to also understanding what they need to move on, because if that information isn't enough, you know, they'll feel like it's not helping their processing as they go through the experience. Mm -hmm. Yep. And maybe last one, maybe Yolanda, know it all. Want to share a bit about know it all? Yeah. Yeah, this person. So maybe it's like whatever they say is correct. And what you're going to take may not be necessarily what you want. And whatever they have in their mind, that's just it. It, it's, it doesn't matter what you say, it's in their head that this is it. And it doesn't matter. Oh, you try to explain, you try to work it out, or you try to justify it. Whatever they have, they stick with it and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. Compromise, they're not willing to hear you out. They know it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, yeah, know it all, like being able to kind of them justifying their uh, decisions um, or like their preference all throughout. But yeah, so I think this, this is great, um, like a great set of you know, all the different, they're not entirely related to like a specific individual, right? But like all the different kind of characteristics of people who are using, um, who not necessarily, I guess, like industry specific, right? But just like archetypes of people who are using our products and, and services. Um, let me move on. So I think as a last kind of um, case study on how I've um, experienced using them uh, or like um, implying them to my work, I'll share like two specific examples that we've used um, in the product uh, that I'm working on. So the first one, and apologies for like the, seems like a little blurred. The first one um, was that we did like a criminal journey mapping experience um, with the client. So the fashion visual you see here, so we had like the high level kind of end-to-end -end experience of our um, of our product or our like the whole experience that involves actually different products. And we were divided into four different uh, groups. Um, with like a specific archetype. So one was, let's say, a nation state thinking about, you know, a nation who's trying to invade or like undermine another nation, organized criminal groups, a hacktivist trying to hack into the system and an insider threat. So someone who's within the organization itself and trying to undermine the system. And so when we were divided into um, that group, um, that those four groups, we were tasked to like look into the end-to-end -end experience and identify what are like the different potential threats and activities that uh, may happen at specific points to undermine the system. And at the end of that process, we uncovered like just these like four examples of of threats. So typo squatting, right? Like, um, yeah, like spamming, spamming our public forums and sending sending you know incorrect information all throughout our system, spoofing, um, change you know changing uh, 
uh, making sure that like the in kind of incorrect spelling of let's say the the website um, and like directing people to that this information so um, providing incorrect information um, to users and then insider crime so someone within um, within the organization and trying to kind of um, like do actions that are or like approve things that shouldn't be approved or like reject things that should that, that should have been should never be rejected and like that sort of thing um but this is like one i guess one specific example of how you can apply this um this way of thinking into uh thinking about the your product experience another thing whoops Another thing that um, we've also done is kind of mapping the different potential errors in scenarios. So how we did this was that, so we thought about, um, as I mentioned earlier, we thought about like the whole um, the overall process and we've identified that, okay, our overall process, there are actually three products supporting this whole process. Under each product, these are like the different services that sit underneath it. Under each service, these are like the different user journeys that sit within it. And then... Um, once we've identified those journeys, then we've identified as well if there is a corresponding unhappy path to that ideal journey. And what how this really helped us is that we because we were able to break down like a very kind of high level process into the granular and the tactical we saw areas of exposure um, that we should be looking at. So we listed out all these like different scenarios on just like a simple Excel sheet, um, like all the possible scenarios that we, yeah, we could think about and then had the team prioritize them based on what's likely to happen and like the risk associated with them happening. Um, and then we had to uh, think about, okay, what should, which of these scenarios, what should we think about now? And what should be like a next month issue or like, you know, something that will probably happen like more, more into the future. And so being able to kind of just like get them all down on paper, like let them, let it all out was actually already really useful for us because it means that, okay, we're, we're not kind of leaving space anymore for things, these things to happen um, unexpectedly. We've like set the time to think about them and we have a plan just in case these things um, happen. Um, all right, so I'll pause here again, if there are like, I guess any questions or thoughts from the group that you'd um, want to share or any yeah, any kind of key things that are standing, uh, yeah, speaking to you. Couple people. Thank you. Just also, uh, if if ever you guys have anything to share in chat, or um, feel free, or or you want to voice out, feel free to unmute. If not, I'm also like Ariano on the time. We do need to. I know you still have one more exercise to go, so we can also proceed to that if you want. Um, yeah. Okay. Um. So I guess I mean this can be also just kind of you know I guess showing this um. We don't need to kind of go through like the full um, exercise, but also showing, I guess, how that this can be applied again in um, in your work. So just this scenario that I put out in here is, let's say, opening a bank account. I think this is something that, you know, most of us have um, already had the experience. So if we look at the typical experience, um, customer journey of opening a bank account, what are like malicious activities or potential errors that might occur at each stage of the journey? And I'll show this mural, um, mural board um, just, I guess, as a reference um, for people in case this is something you want to, um, you know, fill out at your own time, explore and whatnot. But um, I think we have, let's say, maybe like two or three minutes if people want to like add in their thoughts. So how I've designed this kind of uh, board is, so it's just in a typical journey um, mapping experience. You'll, you'll see the different um, steps here at the top around how you typically open a bank account, um, and then the different archetypes um, that I've mentioned earlier here. So I put in some example. You can also use, um, you can also put in some, um, some use some of those archetypes and, and like map the experience from that. So let's say as an, I'll go through them, feel free to like add in any kind of thoughts you have, uh, but I'll go through some of the examples that I put in here. So let's say, for example, for someone who's like confused all throughout, and at the stage of opening a website or downloading an app, maybe they went into the app store and then downloaded a similarly named um, app because they weren't sure what um, what is like the there's like many apps that have the same name or like the same um, um, 
the same logo. Um, let's say for someone who's a big bad wolf, um, uh, uh, yeah, an activity, like an activity or like thing that they can do when someone's about to uh, download uh, uh, an app is website or app spoofing. Again, like uh, making, showing it that like, oh yeah, this is the website, but actually you mistyped a letter, but it's the interface still looks the same. Or um, let me see, let's say, um, so filling the application, right? What a bad actor could be like trying to fake, to put in, or, oops, to put in fake information and spam the system. Uh, all right, it has lost. <laughs> Let me, oh, okay. I don't know where it is. Uh, uh, which one were you looking for, Ariana? Uh, I lost the, the answers. Okay, it might be because it was unlocked just now. Um, you want me to delete certain yeah. things? Mm -hmm. I can continue, but again, I think yeah. we will. Um, so yeah, I think I'll okay. I'll into this after this call. But I think I, people have gotten the gist around how you can use this um, for your teams. So again, really thinking about using some of these archetypes and like mapping different scenarios um, all throughout with like specific um, specific steps, so that you're kind of prepared and know what you can do with your product um, towards the end, if you need to like mitigate some of these risks before you launch or um, yeah, before you um, show your product to your users. Yeah, I think that's um, it for me. Just kind of, there is a one last slide, but it's just like around takeaways and um, let's stop sharing, I guess. Yeah, I think kind of as a last, uh, oops, as a last, um, note for everyone um i think that like again depending on your industry but i think there's really some value in terms of thinking about these different scenarios so that you can plan and prepare um for the future of like any risks that might come up um for your product and yeah if you have like any i think you have the link to this um to this board so if you have like any kind of takeaways even after this session feel free to like drop them in here and yeah share your thoughts Mm -hmm. that was such an informative session okay, while people are still uh putting in their key takeaways and final thoughts i mean we have um three minutes more before we end and move to the next one so if you guys have any questions we still have ariana here uh, maybe that you would want to ask her about her own experience with archetypes and also maybe even stories where it didn't really they needed to retrace and it didn't really quite work that would be amazing to yeah we're open we're open for any questions that you might have okay are there any other because i saw that the ones you shared earlier um the two archetype decks are there any others that we should be looking out for uh this one? to check out um yeah i think there's so there's actually there are how do you describe this? Actually, these two, um, I think, yeah, these two sets. So from what I've read, when I was, I've known about this during like COVID, but from what I understood is that, so Artifact, the innovation agency, they were hired by Omidyar Network to think, create these archetypes. And then eventually after that, um, Artifact created their own kind of tarot cards. But there, I feel like there are also like a couple tools that are available Um I just haven't looked at them um, quite a lot. But yeah, I feel like there are, and I think there are like a couple archetypes that are available, but they're more focused, I guess, yes. on um, oh. ethics. There is like, I think one from uh, IFTF, like Institute from the Future, I think. So all okay. I feel like all these kind of tools are really more focused on like future thinking or like forecasting what might happen in the future. And so... There are, it may not be in the form of archetypes. It can be like in the form of, I don't know, um, just like sets of, um, yeah, maybe like mindsets or just like tools mm -hmm. that people can use. So yeah, these are all really useful in terms of like framing the conversation as well, even with your teams or with your clients and stakeholders. So we might do a roundup post on this in the community. So watch that space. Yeah. Um, okay, I think Supriya just had, um, well, we have a couple of questions actually. Magdalena was asking, can you share which government service site you're working on? And then, um, yeah. So let me. Um, the 
the because the product is in still in private beta, but you can how do I describe? It? I don't have the exact link at the moment, but let me type it. Digital identity register. So that is, you will essentially the core, pro and it will be public. At some, I mean, there is an existing one um, that you will see, It's but it's right now just a an, an, uh, CSV file or like an Excel sheet that sits in the gov.uk. But there will be, um, once we've, um, yeah, once we've gotten out of private beta, it will be live. But essentially the that um, government service site is just a list of identity, pro uh, digital identity providers, but even though that is like what what the public sees, we're building a much more like of, of a system underneath it to make sure that um, the entries that go on there are credible. Um, so that's that. Just looking at the other bits, which of these archetypes have been the most challenging to cover for in your experience? I think challenging in a sense that like, um, it's kind of uncomfortable to, I think that's the, I guess the essence of this. It's very uncomfortable to talk about this. Like the bad actors one is when we were doing the criminal journey mapping, it's kind of like, oh, do I really want to do this? I'm not sure if someone will really do this, but then you can be surprised that of like the different kind of, um, yeah, like the different possibilities that might happen. And so I feel like the challenge is really more around getting over that hurdle because it's really a battle of like moral and ethics and like thinking, oh, was this really, will this really happen? But yeah, I feel like the bad actress one is like always a challenging one to cover um, because you just need to have, to have the mindset of like, okay, if someone's really, you know, really dedicated in undermining the system, how do you like, what can they do? So really getting into that mindset was really challenging. Um, Thank you. These are all like super useful questions. Um, is there anything else that I missed? I think for questions, no. If it's, uh, unless anyone wants to share, we have a couple of minutes more. If not, shame on, let me just also pay for this. So can get going. Going. Okay, I think we're on one. Guys, let's all, um, Ariana just shared tons of information and inspo for us to sink our teeth into after so we will be sharing the links to her presentation uh, after so you guys can geek out on it and maybe also try the archetype exercises and the journey mapping with your own teams or projects um i've also put in the links in chat for you to connect with ariana so please let's all give her a warm welcome for this super informative session uh sorry warm welcome warm thanks <laughs> It's for the super informative session. And as I mentioned earlier, we're doing scenes and scenes to basically celebrate our launch and product month. So we would really, really, really appreciate um, if you could check our product out. Uh, I've dropped the link there in chat. So please do head to product hunt, give us some support, a like, a comment would be really, really um, helpful. And we'd love to also hear your own feedback on what we've developed um, and hope to see you in the next sessions. We have three more coming up. So one is on community and co-creation with Anna Maria, who was who used to be our um, head of community at Butter. So I'm sure that would be a very informative and fun session as well. And then we also have Joris uh, on participation. Patik Joris is already here now. So I'm very excited to see what he's prepared for his own session. And lastly, we also have um, Ash for the F word and icebreakers. So today will be a back day. We still have more than 20 sessions but that's going to be running until tomorrow. So we really hope to see you there. And thank you for joining. Please support and product on. Thank you, Cheska. Thank you, Butter Team. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thanks, Ariana. Bye. Bye. Bye.